So now that we've run through the basics of classical conditioning, let's try and see how they apply to the example of Watson's work with Lil Albert. We talked about this in Unit 1 in the History of Psychology, so this should be familiar with us. If you recall, there was an infant named Lil Albert who was brought into the lab, and Watson wanted to see if he could train a phobia. It was successful. So in this phobia example, we know that originally, as mentioned with the wasps, infants are not afraid of animals. They have to learn to be afraid of animals. And so little Albert was not afraid of the cute white rat or the cute white rodent he was playing with. It was very calming and uh, although we don't have many rats in Alberta, rats are uh, very smart, very gentle and very affectionate and social animals. They make fantastic pets, and the reason why they're often used in behavioral psychology research is they're very trainable. And so this is safe, the rat's not going to bite Albert, there's nothing for him to be worried about. So the rat starts off as a neutral stimulus. It could even be a slightly positive stimulus in this situation, because it was probably very enjoyable. But what happens, although infants are not born with a phobia of rats, they are born with a startle reflex. And so the unconditioned stimulus in this example was a hammer was hit to a large steel pipe right behind little Albert as soon as he was starting to pet the animal and enjoy himself. This loud bang is the unconditioned stimulus and no trainings are needed for that to produce the unconditioned response of a huge startle reflex. This is the idea that hearing that bang that's so startling that he's going to jump and cry and go into panic mode. That's, that's very alarming. So you wouldn't need any training for the bang to cause a startle, but once the bang is paired with the rat, once those two stimuli, those two antecedents are paired enough in acquisition trials, then what happens is the rat becomes the conditioned stimulus. And now with no bangs, just by seeing the rodent alone, little Albert started to have a fear response and started to panic and cry because he had made the correlation in his brain that being around the rat and being nice to the rat led to this loud bang and loud startle reflex. So you can see how the five different types, the neutral stimulus, the unconditioned stimulus, the unconditioned response, the conditioned stimulus, and the conditioned response could all work in this example. Now let's think about some of the outcomes with that. This led to the acquisition of a phobia. And we know that unfortunately, one of the big problems with this, no extinction trials were offered. Little Albert was never allowed to extinguish this phobia. And there's been lots of inquiries into what happened to little Albert. Was Where did he go? How, what kind of life did he have going with this really, really salient phobia from a very young age? We know that while Albert was still in the lab, uh, some generalizations of this phobia were tested and it was found that he still had the panic response to other furry white things. This included other furry animals such as bunnies or cats. And this even included a white furry Santa Claus beard. You can actually find old photos of Watson donning a Santa Claus beard and kneeling down towards the ground uh, with little Albert and just nefariously trying to get a startle out of that poor infant. However, there was also discrimination. We found that little Albert did not have the same fear response when there were rats that were brown or when there was a stuffed animal that was not white, like a brown teddy bear, that it seemed to only generalize to white furry things and not brown furry things. Now the generalization of discrimination could always be different. If this happened to multiple infants, they might generalize to slightly different stimuli and discriminate to slightly different stimuli based on their own experiences and the stimuli they paid most attention to. But this can tell us that Albert was paying most attention to the color and furriness of the animal. And so the color was a big decision in what was generalized and what was discriminated. The last thing I want to talk about with regards to classical conditioning is how many real world examples and applications are out there of classical conditioning. Although this is the earlier type of conditioning that psychology studied, it is very pervasive. As mentioned, phobias are, can be largely explained through classical conditioning. This is the idea that something you have a fear response to was previously paired with something that was very upsetting. And now you're going to continue to have that large fear response. Luckily, most phobias can be very successfully treated with extinction trials. And this is the idea that if you're afraid of spiders, you find a way to be exposed to spiders in a way that no harm and no pain can come to you. It's the idea that if you're afraid of swimming, you find a very safe way with lots of cushions, lots of lots of support where you can play in the water in a very safe way to get over your fear of the water. Nearly all phobias can be treated this way. 
We also have things such as taste aversion. This is avoidance not out of fear, but out of disgust. And this can happen if you are eating something and you get nauseous or you get sick. Uh, and this is the idea that it usually only needs one trial in humans and we get very strong taste aversion. This could happen if you ate something and then you had something else or you had a flu or you had something not related to the food entirely and your body will still blame the food. Uh, myself, I developed a really strong taste aversion to tomato soup uh, way back in 2007. Uh, and that was just because I was eating soup the night before a presentation and I was very nervous and my nerves made me not enjoy my meal. And whenever I looked at tomato soup for, well, a lot of years after that, uh, I still get the sense of panic and the sense of my nerves being wired when I look at the tomato soup. So just one thing of nausea or unsettled stomach can really make us avoid a type of food out of disgust or having an unsettled feeling. We also know that classical conditioning is responsible for a large part of our musical appreciation. We talked a little bit about different types of music and how music can map onto mood in unit four, but we also find that music and mood and emotions can also be tied to what was happening in our body hormonally when we heard certain types of music. Researchers have found that the type of music that one tends to enjoy for the duration of their lifespan tends to be the music they listen to the most when they are going through puberty. And it tends to be the hormonal shift in puberty and the emotional uh, turbulence during puberty helps them to bond with that music even more. And that music always holds a special spot in their heart for the rest of the lifespan. Now we talked a bit about uh, drug addictions in unit five and how tolerance and stimuli can go back. And I just wanna emphasize that once again, even if something is not physiologically addictive, even if it's just psychologically addictive, the cues and the environment with which we use a substance can make us associate that with a positive feeling or with the sense that we need to have it or with the sense that we just don't feel right without it. And so this is the idea that although cannabis is not uh, physiologically addictive and we don't tend to have a large physiological withdrawal from cannabis, it can still be very psychologically addictive. That's because we might associate cannabis with being relaxed or being in a social atmosphere with people we enjoy and those feelings of happiness tend to get mapped with the drug. And so then you might look to and want to have those happy feelings and thinking that you can get them not from the social element, but from the drug element of your experiences. We also know that as audience members, when we watch cinema and TV and virtual reality, it's the idea that it can instill dirt, certain psychic reflexes in us. And one of the best studied ones is the adrenaline rush. Through watching movies with a lot of action scenes or combat scenes or car chasing scenes, although we're sitting sedentary in most cases, it's very possible for us to get a faster heart rate, eye dilation, and all the autonomic reflexes of a fight or flight reflex. If you're watching a very fast paced, high energy uh, action movie, your body is going to start to sweat a little bit and it's going to have those reflexes. Now, as mentioned, a one type of psychic reflex is of course, sexual arousal reflexes. And although those can be somewhat conscious, they can also be unconscious. We can also find that if sexual arousal is paired with other environmental stimuli, this can cause uh, the pairing that leads to the acquisition of a fetish. And there's lots of fetishes in, out in the world that can be learned through just the pairing of certain stimuli. Some of them are very accidental and some of them are more pervasive than what you might think. Going back to those action movies, one of the big uh, mechanisms in a horror movie is to pair a very sexual scene with a very startling scene. So some of the very classic horror movies may be a person in the shower and all of a sudden there's a slasher or it could be someone who's about to have a moment of romance and then there's something very dramatic and violent happening. And this pairing of sex and violence in horror movies has actually been found to lead to the sexual response to violence. And this could be linked with, with why some people, when they watch very gory or very graphically violent types of media, they may become sexually aroused through the pairing of those two types of responses. And finally, just to mention brand personalities. We know that in terms of Watson, he left psychology, he went into business and went into marketing. We've talked about this already, but it's the idea that different brands may evoke a different type of personality for you. Some brands you might perceive as more evil or more friendly or more eco-sensitive or more hip or more dull based on the type of music, taste based on the type of text. And so businesses spend a lot of effort thinking about fonts, thinking about website design, lots of little components of their customer facing components 
of their business will be matched onto other things we've experienced. This is why when we look at icons for mobile apps, there's a big decision whether it will be a red icon or a blue icon because those might mean different things to us or what types of music will play in the background on advertisements or what types of people will appear in televised spots. And it's because they're trying to hone into certain types of brand personalities. So that was a lot on classical conditioning. Next, we're going to jump into operant conditioning.